Uh, and then hopefully we'll have some questions and we can go into more detail about some of the questions that uh, intrigue you. Um, and uh, this is the cover of the book. The book came out in 2019. Now, I have uncovered new material since then because I've had a long legal fight over the last four years to recover their diaries and letters, which were closed uh, until now. Now, some, some 30,000 pages uh, of those diaries stretching from their marriage in 1922 through to his death in 1979 uh, have been made available. And that uh, has added new information to the story. The book principally concentrates on their marriage, which was an unusual marriage in that it was a very loving and mutually supportive one, but also one which was beset with infidelities. So that is going to be part of the presentation, but also, and that explains, I think, a lot of their character and their behavior. But also, I will be looking at their public career, the way that there was a public partnership, uh, and in particular, their time in India, which they loved, but which, of course, has been um, the subject of great controversy ever since. Now, I've got some slides, which I'm going to begin to share with you. Um, let me just do that. So this is the couple getting married in West, just off Westminster Abbey. This is Margaret's church, which is the parliamentary church. Uh, it was the society wedding of the year. The best man was the future King Edward VIII. Uh, and among the guests were King George V and Queen Mary. So here we are getting them getting married in July 1922. Um, the king and queen are among the guests. The future King Edward VIII is the best man. Is this all looking okay now? Yes. Great, terrific. And you can see that something like 8,000 people came to the wedding. It was a, actually a rainy day. That shows something of the interest in this, this, this two glamorous people getting married uh, then. And this is the present they were given, the Rolls Royce, and them being taken to the wedding reception. You can actually watch the wedding um, on a Pathé newsreel. Now, Mountbatten's father was um, the future head of the Navy. Uh, he was uh, related to the royal family. His um, great-grandmother was Queen Victoria. He was the godchild of Queen Victoria. Uh, and Edwina also had close connections with Edward VII. She was named after him. He was her godfather. And the man here in the picture is her grandfather, a very wealthy um, banker called Ernest Castle. She was probably the richest woman in the world when they got married in 1922. And here he is as a young boy, uh, and here's a picture of her as a young girl. Uh, and very quickly, he followed his brother and father into the Navy. He became very close to the future King with the Eighth, which is a picture here, and he escorted him on various tours um, of the world, including a famous tour of India in 1922. Uh, and it's around this time that he met Edwina. This was, in fact, his first girlfriend, a woman called Audrey James. And this is another one called Pamela Payton. Uh, but it was on a, a cruise uh, at a, a, a yachting regatta in 1922 that he met Edwina. This is a picture of him climbing the mast with a friend of his. Uh, and uh, he, she followed him out to India, and it was in Mumbai at the Viceregal Lodge that the two of them got engaged in February 1922. Um, they returned to get married in July 1922, and here they are on honeymoon, uh, going around Europe uh, with their famous Rolls Royce. And then they had a second honeymoon in the States. So here they are with the baseball player Babe Ruth, uh, and here with the actor Charlie Chaplin, with whom they made a film when they went to Hollywood called Nice and Friendly. And they returned back to Britain uh, and Dickie went back into his naval career. He was a signals officer. He was uh, a very successful um, naval officer who was heading for the top. But there was no real role for Edwina. And she became um, rather bored and, and rather lonely. Uh, and uh, they took on this large house just outside Chichester on the south coast of Britain, where they entertained every weekend huge house parties, people like Douglas Fairbanks Jr., the actor, and his wife, Mary Pickford, pictured here. Uh, Dickie had taken up polo when he came to India, and here he is uh, receiving a cup from Queen Mary. 
Uh, and Edwina, as I say, really had nothing to do except shop and see her friends. But there was a brief moment during the general strike in 1926 when a lot of the industrial workers went on strike that she was given a job. Here she is with her friend, Jean Norton, handling the switchboard at the Express newspaper. Uh, their first child, Patricia, was born in 1924. Uh, and that should, in a sense, have cemented the marriage, but in fact, she had very little maternal spirit, uh, and she very quickly began a series of affairs. She's reputed to have had 18 lovers in her during her life, and this was the first, a man called Hugh Sefton, who eventually became the ADC to the Viceroy in India, and then she uh, was involved with this polo player called Laddie Sanford, uh, with whom we think she may well have had a child that was aborted. Then there was uh, this... Um, journalist called Michael Wardle, and then this uh, American financier called Julian Shukra, uh, and then this woman here on the far right called Sophie Tucker, who was uh, an American singer. So she was bisexual as, as well as uh, quite promiscuous. And then uh, a young, much younger man, uh, a golfing blue from Oxford, an American called Bobby Sweeney, and then this man called Tony Simpson, who was serving with Dickie in Malta, and then this actor called Larry Gray, uh, and then rather famously, another actor called Paul Robeson. And there was a great scandal because of course, there was a great prejudice against relationships across the color bar. But Paul Robeson was not the only one she had an affair with who was um, colored. Uh, she also had a long affair with this man called Leslie Hutchinson, who was a singer. And also with her sister-in-law, Nardo Milford Haven, with whom she then basically began to travel the world. She found Britain a very claustrophobic place, uh, and she began to travel across the, um, the Middle East, around South America, and around Southeast Asia. Dickie, while she was away, took on her own lover, this woman called Yoli Letelier, just on his left here, who was married to a French uh, newspaper proprietor. Uh, and then she, um, uh, as part of her various trips, Edwina also became involved with this man called Michael Sapari, who was Hungarian count. Uh, and the most important relationship of this pre-war period was with this man called um, Bunny Phillips, who was um, an army officer with whom uh, Dickie thought she would, she would get married. And here is, Dick, uh, here is uh, Bunny with her in Africa on one of her trips. And here is the lion cub, Sabi, that she brings back to Adzdeen. She found it very difficult to make relationships with, with uh, particularly other women, but, but men, unless they were romantic ones. But she was always very good with animals and with children. And this was partly due to her rather difficult upbringing when she, her mother died when she was nine years old. And here she is, uh, the first woman to drive the 700 miles of uh, the Burma Road in 1939. Now, while she's away, uh, their house in London is pulled down and rebuilt. This is part of this penthouse flat. You can see, very extravagant. It looked out over Hyde Park. Over 120 people could be entertained for lunch or, 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 or drinks parties. Uh, there were a lot of uh, very good pictures, Van Dyke's and else, uh, other things in this flat. And they also inherited as a country house, this place called Broadlands, which is on the south coast of Britain. And it's really the, um, the relationship with the royal family continues. Here is Dickie uh, and Edwina with Wallace Simpson and the future king, uh, Edward VIII at Cannes in 1935. Uh, and then here is Mountbatten bringing the, the Duke, now Duke of Windsor back from France. This is after the abdication. So the, when the war breaks out, Dickey is given command of a destroyer called HMS Kelly. He's actually not a very effective naval commander. As you can see, the ship gets torpedoed, 27 people are injured or killed. Uh, and instead of being court-martialed, which is what the uh, Admiralty want, he is uh, in fact given a, a, a military award. And he's also seen as a bit of a hero. He's brought this, this ship, which has suffered heavily, uh, back to port. And Churchill decides that he is a, a, a sort of poster boy and that he should be, uh, can be used for propaganda purposes during the war. And so he makes him head of combined operations. 
Uh, combined operations are, is the unit the, the, uh, in Britain responsible for raids on occupied Europe and eventually for the D-Day landings in 1944. But the story of HMS Kelly uh, arouses the interest of the playwright Noel Coward, uh, who makes a famous film about it called, um, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, anyway, a famous film made in 1942. And this is the filming of it with the Queen, uh, King George VI. And you can see the present Queen Elizabeth II there uh, in the front row as a young girl. Uh, and th by this stage also, Edwina has got involved in the war effort. Uh, she's joined St. John Ambulance and risen right to the top. Here she is uh, receiving an award at Buckingham Palace in 1943. And this is the beginning of the great public partnership between them. Uh, she's now found a role in some sort of validation. And uh, they increasingly work together, even though their private relationship is more strained uh, in this public partnership. Uh, and one of their roles is to go across to uh, America uh, to help with the war effort and help bring America into the war. Uh, Dickey rises very, very quickly during the war. He's the youngest admiral since Nelson. Here he is at the Casablanca Conference in 1943 as one of the chiefs of staff. So one of the very senior military leaders. And he has done an effective job. Uh, here he is planning for D-Day with uh, General Montgomery. And he is so effective that uh, he has made the Supreme Allied Commander in uh, Southeast Asia. And there he falls in love with this woman called Janie Lindsay, who's previously been engaged to John F. Kennedy, the future president of the United States, and the actor David Niven. And that relationship lasts throughout his period in Southeast Asia, which is from 1943 to 1945. Meanwhile, Edwina is having her own affair with this man called Bill Paley, who is the uh, well-known uh, television and radio journalist. So Dickey uh, is a very effective communicator. Uh, when he's out in Southeast Asia, he raises the morale of the troops. He improves the fighting effectiveness of the troops by bringing in nurses to deal with malaria. Uh, and he also decides to fight through the monsoon. And so a lot of the military reverses of the period up to 1943 begin to change, uh, and the Japanese are beginning to be pushed out of um, uh, Burma and elsewhere. Uh, Edwina also becomes a very effective um, communicator. Here she is talking to troops again out in Southeast Asia, where she's brought uh, people as part of her humanitarian uh, activities to take care of the troops. Uh, one of the things she does is to go out and liberate a lot of the Japanese prisoner of war camps, which is a very brave thing to do. She's often one of the first people into these camps. And this is a picture of her on one of these trips. And as a result of their activities uh, in Southeast Asia, it's decided they would make a very good viceroy and vicerine. Um, Wavell has not been very successful with his plans to bring forward independence. There is, of course, huge discussions um, in uh, between the Hindu and Muslim leaders about the form that independence should take and actually the necessity for partition to, re to recognize the different uh, religious groups. Uh, and Dickey's brought out partly also because he will have the support of the princes as a member of the royal family. So they arrive in March 1947 with instructions to bring independence by June 1948. Now he arrives to find that there's a lot of communal violence, that the Indian leaders are becoming impatient and want their independence, and that um, the Indian, uh, the British Empire is actually not operating very effectively. A lot of the troops want to go home. The Indian civil service is, is, um, doesn't have very many staff, uh, and basically power is ebbing away from the British Empire. So the sooner that they can give away power, the better. So he decides to bring forward independence to August 1947, and also that um, he will partition parts of the country to recognize the different religious groups. Um, but he decides that he will not talk about the boundaries for those partitions until the day after uh, independence in August 47. And the result is there's huge uncertainty and then panic when uh, that happens. And this is a picture of him up in the Punjab. Um, there are 70,000 Patan um, tribesmen have descended uh, and it's quite a dangerous situation. He goes up there to talk them down. Any moment he could have been shot. Indeed, he thought when he went to India that he would be uh, um, assassinated. And Edwina joins him on this railway embankment to help talk the crowd and convince them of their, um, 
uh, of what they're doing. Uh, and it's a good sign, again, of this public partnership that they have, even though they're marital, they have their marital problems at the same time. Now, their job when they get there is, is to win the trust of the various Indian leaders, notably uh, Nehru, the uh, leader of Congress, which they do. He's been educated in Britain, uh, and there's an instant attraction between him and Edwina. So that's very easy for them to do business with him. The problem is the relationship with the Muslim leader, uh, Ali Jinnah, who is much more suspicious of Mountbatten and which there, where there is no real strong personal rapport. Uh, the other person that's, whose trust they win is Gandhi, very much a symbolic figure, but here you can see him putting his hand on Edwina's shoulder as he leaves a meeting, signifying uh, his trust in the Mountbatten's. Um, here are the Mountbatten's with Nehru up in Shimla, and this is a good example of how they showed favoritism to uh, Nehru. They let him in on, for example, their plans for partition and, and um, independence. And of course, this created huge resentment in the Hindu uh, community because he was meant to be neutral. This is just a picture of um, the, one of the advisors to uh, Matt Batten, a man called Peter Murphy, who was a man who he'd met at Cambridge in the 1920s and who basically served with him all the way through his career. Uh, and was used as a sort of sounding board and advisor here with Edwina just, uh, I think, feeling around uh, at, the, at the Rice Regal Lodge. And here she, uh, is Edwina with her new lover, a man called Malcolm Sargent, who's a famous British composer and conductor. So the communal violence uh, erupts in August 1947, something like a million people are killed as people uh, basically move between the different uh, communities, uh, worried that they will be, they will suffer uh, if they remain. Uh, meanwhile, the relationship with Nehru, uh, in a sense, becomes much deeper. Uh, the Mountbatten stay on in India after June 19, uh, well, until June 1948, after independence, uh, as the Governor General of India. And that is the time when the relationship with Nehru really begins to deepen. Uh, she writes to him several times a day, uh, and it's a relationship that will last uh, until her death. Here they are uh, on one of uh, her regular visits to India after independence. She used to come every spring, uh, and uh, Nehru would come to Britain every autumn. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, uh, Mountbatten's have retained their contacts with the royal family. In fact, uh, Prince Philip, the man in the middle here, is the nephew of Mountbatten. Mountbatten has encouraged uh, the relationship between Philip and Queen Elizabeth, future Queen Elizabeth. And indeed, Philip uh, takes on the Mountbatten name when he becomes a British subject uh, in 1947. Uh, Here's a picture of them in Malta with Prince Charles and Princess Anne. Again, an indication of just how close they are to the royal family. Uh, the Queen and Prince Philip are, are, are based in Malta in this period after the, the Second World War. Uh, and you can again see the close links. Here's a picture of them with the Queen and Prince Philip at their country house in the 1950s. And this is the last picture taken of Edwina in February 1960. It's on, uh, it's on a trip to Borneo where she's suddenly taken ill and dies um, of a heart attack overnight. She's only in her 50s. Uh, and um, it's a huge tragedy for the family. Uh, here is the, the funeral. She's actually buried at sea on the south coast of Britain. And Nehru sends a frigate to pay his own respects uh, to her, showing the uh, acceptance that Mountbatten and the family have shown to their love affair. Mountbatten, after this, continues his climb up the um, uh, uh, within the British Armed Forces. He's the first Sea Lord, head of the Navy, and then eventually becomes Chief of the Defence Staff, so head of all the armed forces. Uh, and he has a series of relationships, not just with his long-term mistress, Yola Letelier here, but also with a woman called Shabila Tomaselli, who's still alive, uh, and also with a much younger woman who was his goddaughter called Sasha Abercorn, and also, rather surprisingly, with the American actress Shirley MacLaine. He was very uh, involved with showbiz charities. Here he is with Carol Lombard and, and Clark Gable, uh, and also with Princess Grace of Monaco. Uh, and this is a picture I like because it shows uh, his sense of humor, the fact that he could be quite relaxed. He always seems as very a uh, serious and rather pompous figure, but he could, had a sense of fun uh, and could let his hair down. 
Um, and these are some pictures of, of him taken with his family. He eventually had 10 grandchildren through his two daughters. And here he is uh, with them uh, at their country house uh, in Ireland. They had another house there. Uh, and it's there in August 1979 that he's assassinated by the IRA because he is a symbol of the British establishment. Uh, one of the extraordinary things is that though there's enhanced risk against him that year, his security is reduced. And what they're able to do is plant a bomb on his boat, uh, which isn't guarded, and that is uh, detonated when he goes out fishing one day. He has a huge funeral, some 50,000 people attend. It's broadcast around the world. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, it attracts a lot of attention. Now, this is a man called Graham Yule, who's an army officer who was responsible for a security audit. He's the man who claims that uh, there should have been better protection of the boat and elsewhere, and that he's seen um, uh, IRA activists in the area. And one of the extraordinary things is that no uh, action is taken as a, as a result of his report. Um, uh, and whether that's a cock up or deliberate is, 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 is subject to some debate. Uh, but he is posted uh, even before Mountbatten's death to Hong Kong, uh, as if the officials really don't want him to be around. This is a, a young god grandson of Mountbatten, who was one of the victims. Uh, and here is what remains of his boat, Shadow Five. And this is the man responsible, uh, a bomber called Thomas McMahon. And this is another man who was also responsible, but in fact, didn't go to prison. There was not enough evidence to convict him. Uh, and this is the service in Westminster Abbey. You can see um, the royal family in the front row there, and Prince Charles giving the address. Prince Charles was very close to him. He called him his honorary grandfather. Um, and this is an extraordinary document that I found in the FBI archives showing that, um, or arguing that Mountbatten uh, had a predilection for young boys. Not only was he bisexual, but he was also a paedophile. And this was one of the most controversial uh, parts of uh, my book. I actually interviewed two boys who claimed to have been uh, abused by him. Uh, and the man who abused him was this man called Frederick Lawrence Long, um, who was his tutor when he was a young boy uh, and who married him. Uh, and who I believe was the man who, um, uh, as I say, abused him. So that brings us to the end of the, of the um, PowerPoint. And I'm very happy now to uh, discuss uh, any questions that come up. I'm going to um, uh, try and get back to my screen so that you can see me. Uh, and um, if there are any questions, do I uh, need to get hold of the chat box but I'm very happy to answer them. Let me remind our audience that they need to key in the questions in the chat box. In the meanwhile, Andrew, could you tell us a little bit about how Mountbatten is seen today with the popularity of the serial, the crown, and is he seen as an able administrator back in England or is he uh, somebody who was driven by, the, by forces which were external? Well, the Crown certainly has made him much better known to the general public. I think he's seen very much as a man behind the scenes, a fixer. There's, in fact, one scene where he's involved in, in plotting against the Queen to, to yes. run the country. Um, but I think the, the, the feeling is that he it shows how close he was to the royal family and, in fact, was a, uh, a sort of mentor to several generations right through to Prince Charles. Yes. Uh, I think he's seen as an able administrator um, and uh, a very important figure behind the scenes. So, for example, when the Duke of Windsor died in 1972, uh, it was Mountbatten who was sent to recover incriminating letters and various things and brought, bring them back to the Royal Archives. So, um, yes, he's seen as, a, as, as an important sort of um, uh, guru figure for the Royal family. Um, but, of course, the debate continues uh, about his role in India and whether he sped up independence too quickly and that there were other alternatives. Um, my, own, my own feeling is that um, by 1947, uh, it was pretty clear that there had to be some partition uh, and um, that independence had to be rushed forward. So I think he's, you know, the Indian leaders also felt that they wanted to be in control of their own destiny. They would be in charge of policing the um, 
uh, partition and and what the, what happened afterwards. So um, I think in that respect, you know, he's 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 not as guilty as people say. But you know, the debates continue, uh, and of course, we have the continuing problems with Kashmir and elsewhere, which were sort of set in place at this period. Um, and how is Edwina seen in modern day Britain? Is she still seen as a flighty socialite or is her humanitarian work uh, uh, recognized and appreciated? I, I think she, her, her reputation has grown as his perhaps has, has waned. And I think she is seen as this great humanitarian figure, you know, having been this flighty socialite before the war, but that she has now you know, devote, you know, she devoted most of her life uh, after the war to uh, various charities, particularly in places like India. Uh, and she went around the world with Save the Children. So she is now a pretty saintly figure. Um, uh, and of course, people remain intrigued by the um, relationship with Nehru and, and what sort of relationship it was. Speaking of Nehru, there's a question from the audience. What was his relationship with Sardar Patel? Sorry, I'm just looking at the questions here. Um, uh, what was Mountbatten's relationship with Sardar Patel? Well, I mean, I think all of these relationships, he tried, you know, he tried to get all the Indian e uh, leaders on side. I think they, he, um, I didn't think they always entirely trusted him, but his job was to deliver independence quickly. Uh, and that's what he did. Um, the, the British were focusing the new Labour government on their social reforms in Britain. Uh, there wasn't much money in the kitty. Uh, the empire was draining resources. And so he really had to move very, very quickly. And I think a lot of people did feel let down, particularly the princes, because he kind of betrayed them. He said that they must choose between either India or Pakistan. But in fact, there were some other options open to them. Um, but I think um, uh, the relationship with most Indian leaders was, 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 was pretty good. I think they realized that he, he was determined to give them their independence. And, and um, certainly with Congress, he worked very well. I think, as you say, with the Muslim League, there was much more suspicion about him. Um, now I'm looking at some of these other questions. What about, did, what about his daughters, Andrew? Did they have similar warm feelings for India as the parents did? Yes, absolutely. And they've written uh, books, uh, yes. Pamela's written books about it. And um, uh, it was a huge love affair with India for all the family. Um, and I think they've just gone down even to the grandchildren. And I think they still visit a lot uh, and remain in touch with a lot of the, the figures and indeed the, 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 the families. Um, and you have uh, one of the grandchildren named India. Exactly. One of them is named India. Absolutely right. India Hicks. Yes. Uh, India Hicks. So uh, absolutely. No, I mean, it, you know, it was a very, it was a very profound moment for them. I mean, it was where they got engaged uh, and in some ways the most important role of their life. And they, from, sorry, sorry. Uh, and, you know, she came every year. He came several times after 1947. So it was a place that they loved. Uh, question from Anita. Didn't these affairs cause scandals and... Uh, uh, a related question. I would have thought that these extramarital affairs would have led him to step down from his various roles. Well, I think people, uh, his, his feeling was that as long as these um, affairs um, on both sides were discreet and people didn't know, and we had, of course, quite a differential press that didn't really report on them, that was absolutely fine. Um, as long as it didn't affect his career in the Navy and didn't affect um, his relationship with the royal family. But there was a cover up, but there was a certain amount of hypocrisy because, uh, for example, uh, it was it was um, against the law to, to, to be gay uh, until 1967 in Britain. And in fact, you could be thrown out of the Navy if you were gay, even until 2000. Uh, and it was known that he was gay, so or bisexual. So, um, you know, double standards were applied uh, and he was protected by the establishment. You're right that any of these things should have precluded him from some of the senior positions, particularly given the risk of blackmail. Uh, and there is some suggestion that he may have been blackmailed by the Russians. They have a, a spy called Admiral that they claim was Mount Patton. Um, but um, though in those days, the press covered up things uh, and so people just didn't know. Um, and that cover-up was in deference to the royal family and its extended members, or it was just because they wanted to be polite? 
No, it was in deference to the royal family. They could see that this would be embarrassing. Um, they didn't want to curtail his career. And indeed, in my fight for these diaries and letters, one of the reasons, one of the, the things that they've kept back is any reference to the royal family, even going back to the 1920s. So there's, there's, it's the, the, the authorities in Britain, uh, and I suspect also in India, are very protective of any um, a scandalous mention of the royal family. Um, which makes it, of course, very difficult to research books because the material is, is just not there to, to, to look at. Um, uh, and someone has asked here about the influence with the royal family. Um, well, uh, as I say, um, uh, the, the way he, he influenced the, the royal family to take on the name Mountbatten was that he got his nephew who married the queen to take his name, Mountbatten. Uh, and then there was a big debate um, uh, after that because Philip wanted the family to take on his name, Mountbatten, rather than Windsor. But the royal family felt they'd only just got this name Windsor from the First World War. Um, and so they did a compromise. So they're actually now called Mountbatten Windsor. Um, but he did. He, in effect, created a dynasty. And he was very keen to not only uh, of, uh, encourage the relationship between Philip and, and Elizabeth, he was the one who actually introduced them uh, and with George VI uh, pushed that relationship on. But he also tried to get Prince Charles to marry his, his granddaughter, Amanda. Yes. Yes. So, um, so he, he was, he was a great fixer. Um, you know, he was determined to be at the center of power over several generations. Would you consider Mountbatten the right choice to lead the Indian independence and partition negotiations for Britain, especially given his less than stellar record in the service? Well, this is a question well, from Angela. Right. Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think he was um, a man of the left. He'd, he'd, he'd recognized when he was Supreme Allied Commander of Southeast Asia, the power of the nascent nationalist movements. Um, uh, it was a Labour government, so they were keen to bring in someone that they thought would be forward looking uh, and also would appeal to the princes because of his royal connections. So I think it's on paper he looked a good candidate. He was someone who was very good at working with people. He was a good negotiator, um, but he was very impetuous uh, and um, impatient. And I think that you know it needed someone who really knew India better uh, and was prepared to perhaps... Um, not want an instant fix. Uh, poor old Wavell, who was the uh, the viceroy, who in effect was kicked out from Mountbatten in mm. the spring of 47, had all sorts of plans, which I think in retrospect might have been more effective and led to less bloodshed. Um, but again, that's, that can be debated. It's all hypothetical because we just don't know what would have happened under different plans. But that would have been a sort of um, gradual um, retreat by, ter by territory, properly making sure that the interests of the different communities were protected, rather than just this, this scuppering uh, suddenly one day in August 1947. Um, and uh, what, uh, was there any negotiation involved in the title being passed hereditarily down to the daughters? Yeah, it was an, that was an interesting uh, concession that he got, but there were a number of titles given during the Second World War to senior arm, um, uh, armed force people, which allowed for one generation the, the title to move through the daughter. Um, it hasn't really happened since, so uh, until recently when they changed the law. But it was, a, I suppose, a special dispensation. But he had, of course, the great support of George VI, and he was often able to get things through for his own personal gain because of these close connections with the royal family. Um, now, someone has asked here, do the records show if there was any negotiation or there was negotiations with Congress or Congress simply accepted Mountbatten's plan? Well, I think the time for negotiation by 47 had run out. He basically presented it as a fait accompli as the only way forward. I mean, he had discussed things with, with the Congress leaders. I mean, they've been appeared meeting them literally every day from March through to the summer of 47. But I think once he came up with the successor to the Balkan plan, which had been approved by Nehru up in Shimla, I think he basically said to, to Congress, you know, you must accept it. This is the only way we can move forward. And Jinnah sort of reluctantly agreed to that. He, this is a case where he just nodded his head. Um, he, he had to push things through. The time for talking had ended, and I think everyone realised that. 
So, Andrew, what was the nature of these visits post-independence? You said uh, Pamela would come, uh, uh, that Edwina would come every summer and Mountbatten too would come. So, were they like social visits or was there any humanitarian work or is there like some goodwill visits? Well, she came every spring and she came as a mixture of humanitarian and social. So she would sometimes go on holiday with Nehru to different parts of India. She stayed with him in Mumbai, um, but it was ostensibly as part of her work with Save the Children and St. John Ambulance. That was the purpose. Uh, and she remained you know, very involved with, with various humanitarian concerns in India and elsewhere. Often she was on her way through Southeast Asia. His visits tended to be either social or when he was filming the, the 12 part series on his life uh, in the 1960s, or indeed on royal business. He was used like Prince Charles for sort of soft diplomacy because of his continued connections with Indian leaders. Uh, and he remained in very close contact with Nehru, friendly with Nehru in spite of the affair. Um, and so this was used by the British government. Um, and of course he had dealings you know, as head of the armed forces with, um, with India too. Um, so it remained a very close connection. Um, okay. Um, and some, someone's asked, are there any relations of Lady Mountbatten alive? Uh, well, yes, there are. Um, the, the two daughters, uh, one of the daughters, Pamela, is still alive, uh, aged 93. Uh, she has three children who are all alive. I mean, we've talked about India Hicks. And Patricia, the older daughter, only died a few years ago, and she has seven children, all of whom, um, or one died in, in, with the, the assassination of Mountbatten, but the rest are alive. So um, there is a huge Mountbatten sort of dynasty. Um, uh, and of course, there are the children of um, uh, Lady Mountbatten's sister as well. So yes, uh, plenty of them around. And, and, and what happens to Broadlands now? Is it still with the family? Yes, Broadlands is still with the family. It's it's uh, the eldest son of um, uh, Patricia Norton uh, lives there with his wife uh, Penelope. Uh, um, uh, it's open to the public. You can go and visit it, but they live in part of it. So um, yes, the connections remain. And and would that make him the third uh, uh, Earl Mountbatten? Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, Anita has clarified if there are any relatives from her side of the family. Uh, of, of, of Lady Mountbatten, yes. She had a sister um, uh, and who married and had children. In fact, I interviewed them for the book. Uh, both the sons are, are now dead, uh, but they had children who are still alive. Um, so, uh, yes, there, there, there are certainly people around. We still have time for a few more questions. Uh, uh, if you would like to key in any questions in the chat box. I have a question. Um, what, what would Mountbatten's reaction be to uh, religious communalism of kinds that we are seeing in certain pockets in India now? I think he would be very sad to see that um, because, you know, he had known a time when all the communities worked very closely together. You know, he had friends right across communities, even though he didn't have a great relationship with, with Jinnah. Um, uh, but I think he would have been very sad to see the situation. And he was indeed very, I mean, you know, uh, shocked by the, the, the extent of the communal violence, even in August 47. Uh, and in some ways, his finest hour in that we know was when they, you know, their humanitarian work when he, as governor general um, in that period. Uh, and I think he felt terrific guilt. In some way, he was responsible for this by having not ensured that the um, uh, arrangements had not been properly policed, that we had, uh, you know, trains going from one community to another, which were attacked and not protected. Uh, you know, he did reflect much later in the 1960s that he had made a mess of India. I mean, he was open about that. Um, so depending on who he talked to, he, you, you got different reactions. But I, I think, you know, like everyone, he, he feels very sad, would have felt very sad that, that a, a country which had, where the communities have got on so well for so long um, should, have, should have divided in this way. Um, 
I remember one particular picture, was it Life or Time magazine, which highlighted uh, Edwina's humanitarian work during the partition. A very yes. famous picture. Yes, what absolutely. Was his, what was his stance during 47 war and Gandhi assassination? Well, he was very concerned with the, the, the and again, shot by Gandhi's assassination. Uh, and he knew that if uh, it had been a Muslim, that that would, of course, exacerbated the problems. So actually, when someone asked, he, he lied and he didn't know the answer. He said, no, 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 it was a Hindu, uh, which, of course, it was. Um, uh, now, someone was also asked, well, did he appoint Radcliffe um, to the job of partitioning? No, he didn't. Uh, that was an appointment made in London. It was a strange appointment because, of course, Radcliffe knew nothing about India. Um, but that was meant to be a strength. Uh, I think the problem for Radcliffe is that he, his, um, his small committee divided on communal lines. And so uh, it was very difficult for him to do things. He was working on very old maps and he was having to make decisions very quickly on a whole series of different factors, whether, you know, to do with populations, to do with rivers, um, uh, physical boundaries. Um, and so these tensils were very difficult to divide up, but it's quite clear, I think, that Mountbatten, who should have been totally independent from Radcliffe and not put any influence on it at all, did, under pressure from others, uh, put pressure on him. And of course, the, the, the one or two famous instances with arsenals and with river, source, uh, river sources and things, um, but giving those to India rather than Pakistan. Um, so I think Pakistan uh, are just, could just probably be feel that they were not treated favor uh, as fairly by Radcliffe and Matt Batten as they should have done. Um, a trivia question. You said they got engaged in Mumbai. Would you know where? Uh, well, she went to stay in uh, with the Viceroy. That, that's the sort of connection she had. And um, he was also there with the Prince of Wales on this uh, tour. Um, so they literally um, got, got engaged uh, at the, the Viceregal Lodge there. Um, what we call uh, Raj Bhavan now. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of changed. But um, no, they had, you know, they, they, they were there. I mean, the, the, the feeling was that actually he wasn't a very good match. There she, it was a worry that he was a gold digger uh, for her money and that he had no real prospects. And, and, and in fact, the Viceroy wrote to her father complaining about him. Um, someone's asked, did, they, did he visit India after uh, Edwina's death? Absolutely, he did. Indeed, he came out, I think, on with one visit. Uh, with Prince Charles, but there were probably three or four visits in that period after her death between 1960 and 1979 when he died. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Andrew Lonnie. It was a great uh, treat to listen to these inside stories. And of course, the pictures were uh, many of which people would not have seen over here. And it was great listening to the stories. But it's nice to know that on balance, he was seen as an able administrator and not blamed for the carnages of partition. Well, I hope so. I mean, that, that is a view clearly that needs to be taken in India as well. But I think historians feel that with the cards he was dealt, he, he, he played the best hand he could. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, it was a pleasure listening to you. Thank you, audience. Please do attend all of our future talks. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy them very much. Thanks again. Good night. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye-bye. And, and have a nice day to you, Lon, uh, Andrew. Oh, yeah, same to you.